It's time now for Ask the Surgeon, brought to you by Everett Bone and Joint. Everett Bone and Joint, the best choice to get you back in the game. Learn more at everettboneandjoint.com. Okay, welcome back to everybody's microphones are working, right? I, I'm check, Perfect. check. Okay, <laughs> buttons are pushed. Uh, my guy, my doc, Dr. Bill Wong from uh, Everett Bone and Joint, orthopedic surgeon. Uh, there is a new anterior approach to total hip replacement surgery. I have no idea what I just said, but he's with us to talk about it. How are you? Pretty good. How are you doing, Maury? Good, thanks. Good. Now, uh, first of all, hip arthritis is the first thing I want to know. What is What happens when you have hip arthritis? Basically, the cartilage in the hip is completely worn out, so you end up with essentially bone on bone in the joint. And, and, and that's when you get it replaced, right? That's when people have pain. They can't walk. They can't tie their shoes that, you know, they, they can't stand, they can go shopping, and um, we try to treat them conservatively. And if they fail, then we offer them hip replacement surgery. And, and how common is that? Because we hear about the knee and the hip, um, those two joints obviously being weight-bearing joints. What do you see more, hip or knee arthritis? By far, knee is most common, but hip is right up there. And uh, I would say on average there's probably 600,000 hip replacement done in the States you know, wow. per year. So 600,000. 600,000. And, and the ages are getting getting lower now, right? Ages are getting lower because people want to stay active and uh-huh. want to do stuff. And, um, and fortunately, our technology has gotten better. So we're able to do some of these surgery in younger patients without having to worry too much about the implant uh, going back prematurely. What's yeah, the, yeah, you, yeah, it used to be like 20 years ago. Right. I mean, you had to be a certain age because they didn't even know how long the implant would last. Yeah. yeah. And when you say technology, you're talking about... I well, mean, the implant itself? Yeah, the implant itself, how we fix the implant to the bone, um, the material, the bearing surface, they're just, they're just better. I What's mean, the youngest person you've, uh, you've replaced a hip for so far? Someone in the 20s, 25, okay. 24. Serious? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But a person like that would have some kind of maybe genetic That's predisposition. A rare, I mean, well, they have injury, like you know, a bad accident, uh-huh. you know, um, mess up the joint, or they could have uh, some rare condition called avascular necrosis, where the blood supply to the bone um, just die out. Uh-huh. Bo and Jackson, that's what Bo Jackson. I had that yeah. too. Yeah, you had avascular necrosis. So yeah. talk about that and tell tell people out there listening when you say avascular necrosis, what's going on there? Yeah, it's one of those really weird events that we don't really know why it happens. All we know that at a, a cellular level, the bone essentially loses a blood supply and the capillary dies off and you end up with unsupported cartilage and it collapses and it develops secondary arthritis. Mm-hmm. And it, it happened to a subset of patients, but we don't really know what caused it. I mean, we know like people that XYZ could, um, you know, are more pre- predisposed to that. But um, but it is one of a mystery in medicine on what why people get AVN. So so as far as is um, hip arthritis, what what are the uh, what are the, what are your options if you have it? Well, I mean, basically the best option is by far the hip replacement. Replacement, right? And that has been done for a long time, and we have done hip replacement through a different ways throughout its invention. Uh-huh. And initially in the 1960s, when we do hip replacement, we really have to cut down a lot of bones and muscle to do it. We have gotten a lot better since the 1960s. Is that when it started? Is that yeah. when replacement surgery? The, I would say the modern total hip replacement uh-huh. started in the late 60s. Uh-huh. Well, hang on, Bill. Now, when you say total hip, I mean, let's, let's talk about total. I mean, when you do a hip replacement, are you replacing the ball and socket both? Correct. I mean, in the knee replacement section, we, there's a thing called partial replacement. But in a hip, generally you can do a partial hip replacement, but most of the time when people come see you, the cartilage is gone from the socket and the cartilage is gone from the ball. So um, generally most time you will do a total hip replacement. And, and things that kind of set you up for um, what we call, we're calling osteoarthritis, just the wear and tear. I mean, things like weight, activity levels, is there anything else you've seen? I would say genetics. Genetics? I think if you have arthritis running in your family, more likely or not. I mean, we don't exactly know how that gene is, you know, a pass on from generation to generation, but it's definitely a, there's a family predisposition. Mm. And, and we've talked about the osteoarthritis sure. a lot. And, and what that is is that cartilage on your joint just doesn't have the ability to repair itself. Correct. And, and when, it, when it's worn out, it just— Yeah, it's is... kind of like a ball tire. Right. You, you know, you're, the rubber's gone, and you, you got no traction. The only way to fix that is got to get a new set. So, so you are one of the uh, few surgeons in the area that's doing the anterior total. 
Explain to us what that means. Yeah, I'm really excited about doing that. I was trained in that technique, um, it, it, you know, before, but traditionally doing an anterior total hip is extremely difficult without special equipment. And uh, recently, our hospital just purchased this very fancy what we call the, the HANA table. Um, this allow us to expose the hip the correct way to do this anteriorly. And the reason I'm excited about this technique is that it is really a um, it's not a new way of doing hip replacement, but this way has been around. But the, our, our modern interpretation of this technique allow us to do this safely and predictably. And the advantage of this by far is that we don't have to split any muscle. We actually get into the hip joint without cutting any muscle. And so um, the patient actually feel far less pain after surgery. And afterward, the recovery is a lot faster. And traditionally, people hear about, oh, I'm going to have a hip replacement. It's going to pop out a socket. Um, that's the reason because we have to take out some of the little muscle in the hip that holds the hip in. And with this anterior approach, we're able to do a hip replacement and keep all these little muscles. So you know, the dislocation rate is maybe 1 20th of traditional hip replacement. So what you're talking about is you're going through the front of the hip joint versus kind of what the traditional technique was the posterior lateral or going basically through your buttocks muscles. Yeah, you can go through the buttocks muscle. Or you can go through the side. There's actually five, seven way of different, get, different way of getting into the hip joint. Uh, this is the only way that we can get into the hip joint without taking down any muscle. And when you take down the muscles or you split the muscles, what happens postoperatively that makes that area weak. And a lot of people, like you said, used to dislocate from that weakness. Yeah. So with this anterior approach, you can be more aggressive in the rehab, people can return to activity. What's the advantages yeah, of that? Well, in, in terms of, you know, um, Shannon, you're a physical therapist. Right. You know, after surgery, we put patients on certain kind of hip precaution. We told them not to cross the leg certain way, be careful on bending over and all that different Forever things. Forever or just right after you know, surgery? Initially, uh-huh. very strict, but you're always at risk for dislocation. So, you uh-huh. know, guys who had hip replacement 10 years out, if they go skiing and they're not super careful about putting on their bindings, the hip can pop out. Mm-hmm. But this particular way of doing it, uh, we actually preserve all that little muscle, which is very important, keeping the hip in the socket. So actually, immediately after surgery, right now, our patient on the floor, if I do it through this technique, um, they don't have any precaution. Therapists are ecstatic. They right. don't have to worry, explain to them not to cross a leg, all that different thing. There's no elevated toilet seat. All right. that stuff we have for patients before doesn't really apply to this group of patients. Wow. That's, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it sounds great from a therapist standpoint. Yeah. It sounds wonderful because, I mean, sometimes just getting the patient to understand the precautions is half the battle. So, I mean, the other thing, too, during surgery, if you're not splitting the muscle or moving the muscle, it seems like it's going to be less painful for the patient. It is for sure less painful. In fact, I had a patient I done recently that a few years ago I done a traditional technique from the back. And we just did another technique this time around. He said it was night and day. He was off the pain medication within five days of surgery. What is? Go ahead. I was just going to ask how long the uh, the old way. How long are you in the hospital for, and how long are you in the hospital for now? Well, well typically, you know, um, people stay in the hospital for about you know anywhere from three to five days, mm-hmm. depending on the age, depending on how they recover. Right. But a lot of these folks who you would do this anterior, they have so little pain. In fact, we actually have them. T- have to tell them not to do too much. Mm-hmm. Slow them down a little bit. Yeah, slow them down a little bit because, you know, the tissues still have to heal and all that stuff. Um, but it's really exciting because um, because this group of patients actually, you know, um, recover rather quickly. Wow. We are uh, – th- this is this is incredible stuff. Dr. Bill Wong, uh, my doc from uh, Everbone & Joint, we're talking about the new uh, uh, hip replacement surgeries. Um, how long do these hips last? Well, that is a difficult question to right. answer. Okay. Um, typically, what I tell patients is there's a 1% failure rate per year. So if you extrapolate that out, at one year after surgery, there's a 99% chance your knee or hip is doing well. Mm-hmm. At 10 years, there's probably a 90% chance that it's still doing well and 10% chance additional surgery will need to be done. But that's based on the older stuff. I mean, right. I think the material we have uh, – more recently, in fact, the one that you have in yeah. your body are what we consider the more modern material. I think those data right now is suggesting that our, our implant is going to last twice as long. Hmm. You know, when you do a hip replacement, particularly anterior, does it, does it I mean, I know, you're, you know your technique, is it easier to do that for you guys if you go anterior? I mean, getting the height and the placement of the new prosthesis? Actually, uh, 
actually is more precise because we do this particular way we can judge the leg. We have x-ray doing surgery. Um, without that table I'm talking about, it's extraordinarily difficult to do that surgery. But now with that new equipment we have at Providence, um, it actually uh, makes it feasible to do this operation. And just so people out there listening know, Bill has a fellowship in total joints. And that means, you know, after your surgical residency, you went on to an extra year just in total joint replacement, particularly knee and hip. That's correct. So when when would you recommend... So that just means that he's really good at doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And We're really good at be. doing anterior, <laughs> posterior both, but more anterior, yeah. <laughs> so when, in, in your experience... When do you see people seeking your attention? Is it a quality of life? Is it just pain? I mean, why do people have or want their hip replaced? I think it would be a combination of both. I think Maury can attest to that. Right. When you get to a point that you have pain and you can't do the stuff that you enjoy doing and your quality of life become, be, you know, uh, starting to deteriorate. And I think that's when you start treating. And most, most of the time we start out with conservative management and try the medication, try the injection. But when that fails, the only thing we got is to replace it. This is going to be a stupid question. But, but I wouldn't know what, where in my body is my hip going to, the pain I'm going to be looking for for my hip. Great question, because a lot of times folks come and see me and ask me, well, my hip hurt, and they're pointing to the back. Right. So most of the time, 90% of the time, people who have hip arthritis will be complaining of anterior groin pain, right mm-hmm. in that groin area. Mm-hmm. Um, we call it pocket pain. Yeah, and that's where, if they hurt in that area, there's a high likelihood the pain is coming from the hip socket. Got and, it. And, okay. and that pain, uh, most people describe it kind of as a nagging toothache. I mean, sometimes they have it at rest. Yeah. I mean, it just kind of just doesn't go away. It's there all the time. All the time. That's the biggest thing, pain. Yeah. And you know what? The ones I see postoperatively at two to three weeks, that's the biggest thing they tell me is, wow, I wish I would have done this a long time yeah. ago because my pain has gone away. Now, they have a little bit of rehab to do. Yeah. But basically, six weeks post-op, I mean, they're doing pretty good, aren't they? Yeah. And, and these group of patients who um, get an anterior total hip, um, the study have shown that at six weeks, they're functioning at a higher level compared to traditional patient in terms of wow. all the stuff that we can measure in terms of activity and in terms of their endurance and in terms of strength. They're all better because we did not violate the muscle. Yeah, the muscles are a big thing. A big key here is not, not splitting or taking down the muscle. Yeah. How long has the anterior approach been around? It's been around just as long as any other technique. It's just because of lack of the appropriate uh, equipment, um, only very few people have have been doing anterior because the exposure is very difficult. And if you do an anterior approach, let's say, you know, by chance you have to have a revision, is it better that you did the first one anterior? Does it make a difference, I mean, in um, the revision? There, there are folks um, perform revision through the front. I mean, you can do that through the front. Can I, can I ask a question? You talk about revision. What breaks down, hardware or the patient? Um, usually it's a hardware. Or the hardware. Yeah, okay, usually, you're gonna wear you're yeah. gonna wear this thing out. Yeah, usually the hip, the hip or knee socket, the 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 material in there over time is kind of like any bearing surface, um, just get worn out after so many cycle of use, and once that start wearing out, it generally is inflammation and it cause a cause a body to react to it, and that's the reason why we go after it. So when when you do this, I mean you're putting a new stem and ball in. And then a new cap in the socket. Yeah. Are you? Are these glued in or this bony ingrowth? This is a bony ingrowth. These these are um, has small little pores on the surface that over time, in, in the first month and a half, the bone actually grow into these little pores. If if somebody is is young and active and they have their hip replaced, what is there anything that they can't do that you suggest they don't do after they get their hip replaced? You know, great question. People have done that study on what activity level leads to premature failure of knee or hip replacement. Right. Um, you know, those studies are, are, you know, they're not a whole lot of study out there. But generally, we recommend um, avoiding impacting activities. Mm-hmm. So, i.e., you know, any kind of running and jumping. And what I typically tell a patient is that there's a distinct difference of doing those exercises for fun or doing those exercises for exercise. Right. So if you run because a dog is chasing you or if you're you're running because occasionally you play some basketball, I think that's fun. Right. But if you end up running, your goal is to do a marathon, I think you will put additional wear to the um, implant. So it's impact. It's the pounding type stuff. Well, like when you were talking about – you were talking about somebody uh, skiing with it. uh, it, You know, I was thinking if I had a total hip replacement, skiing would be the farthest thing – that I would think about doing. Warren you know? Miller. Warren Miller, I think, yeah. has both his hips really? replaced. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Bill, me, I, thank you. I jumped out of a plane. Yeah, yeah, with a knee. 
Uh, wow, this is crazy stuff. For more information, everettboneandjoint.com is a great place to go to win and uh, check out all this Dr. Bill Wong. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great Thanks seeing for having you. me. Stick around. Coming up next, we're going to talk about the Youth Fitness Expo. It's uh, Health Matters with Maureen Shannon, brought to you by Integrated Rehabilitation Group on Fox Sports 1380.